Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. Another beautiful day out here. This is just gorgeous. This is a blessing, indeed. Um, the song numbers are up over there. We did do a change, so what you see in the bulletin is not correct. We had to change some songs. So we're doing number 11, How Great Is Our God, number 21, The Heart of Worship, and number 27, You Are My King, Amazing Love. So that's the songs that we'll be doing. So we're here to worship our God. He's a great God. He is all that we need. Um, i got to be honest with you. If, if I would rely on him more, my life would be a lot smoother. But sometimes I take the wheel and right off the road I go. I think, I think everybody can really relate to that. But he's a great God. If we rely on him, he's there for us. You stand and join us, and let's just sing How Great Is Our God. Sing with me. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light Darkness hides to hide Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God had three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb. Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names. Great is our God. Name above all names. You are worthy of all praise. My heart will sing. How great is our God. me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God then sings my soul sing with me then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art Our God. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Bless 
lift our voices. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great. How great is our God. Pray with me. Father, we believe that from the bottom of our hearts and what a blessing, a privilege it is to, to be able to gather together on this glorious morning, to be able to unite our voices in praise and, and celebrate who you are, reflect on your glory. We collectively bring our voices and our hearts before you and tell you, you are great. You're the one and only true and living God. You've created it all. You hold it together. Um, you're intimately acquainted with all of our ways, actively involved in, in every fiber of our being. You know all things. You're everywhere present. And you are all-powerful, almighty God, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Father, we could go on all morning, all day, throughout the week, just de declaring and describing who you are and, and what you do. And it would all be in excellence because as for God, his way is perfect. And, and we acknowledge that we need you this morning. And we're so grateful for the work that you've begun to do in our lives. Thank you for your son, Jesus who willingly took our place on the cross and, and died for our sins. He was that sinless, spotless lamb. Uh, never once did he do something in his own strength. Never once did he sin or fall short. But you made him who knew no sin to be, come sin on our behalf, in our place, to bear that that righteous wrath towards sin as our substitute. And three days later, he rose again so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. We praise you for such a, a great salvation through faith in Christ. Thank you that that changes us from the inside out, that it, it completely redeems us. And one day it'll take us home to be with you forever and ever and ever. And Father, we pray if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't understand that fully, we ask that your spirit would just work in their hearts. Use your word to draw them to a savior this morning. For those of us that have experienced that amazing grace about which we'll continue to sing this morning and study we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. May we live accordingly. May we allow your son Jesus to just live through us and your spirit to control us so that everything we do brings you glory and honor. And Father, we include this service in that. We commit it to you by committing ourselves to you, asking you to have your will and your way in our lives. Open our hearts to you and draw us to Jesus. We pray these things in his wonderful name. Amen. Thanks. You can be seated. We welcome each of you to the service. We're glad that you're here. It, it really is a blessing um, to, to gather together. And I don't know about you, but I'm kind of thankful for the weather we're having today as we meet versus Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. It was hot, and I'm not complaining. But boy, is this wonderful, a beautiful morning to be able to gather together and the shade of the tree, the sun's out for those who want it, and to be able to lift our voices in praise and, and exalt him together. And so we extend a warm welcome to one and all. So glad that you're here with us, and we look forward to worshiping God with you. I'm just going to cover a couple of announcements that are in our bulletins. Um, there's a couple of them left over on the table if you didn't receive it by email or pick one up this morning, but it'll tell you about the different ministry opportunities and that are available to us and what God is doing. But I'm going to call your attention to just a few of them real quickly as we continue our worship. The first one is this. Um, I want um, to say thank you to all of you who were involved in Vacation Bible School this past week. Um, what a glorious week it was. And, and when I say that, I, I believe I'm probably thanking most of you because I know, at least I hope you were all at least praying. 
praying that God would use this time in the, the lives of young children and their families. And that is an active way to be involved. But I'm going to ask those who were actually physically here, even if it was just one day to, to do something, would you please stand? We just want to recognize you. Even if you brought cookies, if you helped serve, if you led people, did it in the bounce house. Stand up, folks. If you are involved, I just want to say thank you. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you guys for all that you've done and Paul and Missy for coordinating everything and bringing those summer missionaries here to, to be with us. What a blessing. Um, I only made it out Friday night and I spent the first 20 minutes watching the kids in the bounce house and enjoying the breeze and then I went inside and boy was it hot and it wasn't even your hottest day of the week guys. Um, just to, but it was wonderful to see the students, the kids, the, the helpers, the workers, and just be praying that those seeds planted will bear fruit in God's time. And thank you for everybody that's been involved in Vacation Bible School. Be praying for the additional children's ministries that'll start back up here in just a, a few weeks, like a Hapwa, a fall festival, um, you know, Sunday school and things for children and adults will be starting back up the, the, the third weekend in September and we'll give you more details about that as that's coming closer but what a blessing to to have a ministry go on this whole week and um, just be thankful for the way that God has been working and for all of you that sacrificed and volunteered uh, the next thing that's taken place as far as ministry takes place this evening uh, at the home of Brad and Linda Jones um, up Parish Street the actual address is listed in your bulletin but we have our next backyard gathering scheduled tonight six o'clock at the Jones's place bring a, a, a chair in which to sit a lawn chair that's comfortable and um, bring a generous dish to share they'll be providing the the main course we'll bring the other things and come out in fellowship connect with one another we'll worship we'll spend a few moments in God's word and but the main thing is we'll connect with one another and you don't want to miss it uh, I, I think it's the first backyard gathering that my understanding is there's not a threat of rain you know, it might have changed some of the numbers we've had. Thanks for Larry and Gene last Sunday being flexible. A lot of people probably saw the storm coming through, chose not to come, but we still had 30 or 40 people, and it was a wonderful time of fellowship. Tonight, it's at the Joneses at 6 o'clock. Join us. Great time of fellowship. And it continues on Thursday night for you guys. It's our annual stakeout for us men to gather together and have a, a great meal together and to connect with one another, and we limit limited the tickets um, and today's the last day and um, we limited them this year to 50 tickets and my understanding is am I still correct there is one left one left if you want to join us this coming Thursday night get here around six o'clock guys oh by the way some of you that want to it can be you or your wives or somebody you can if you want to bring a dessert we can use that we'll provide everything else but we could use some desserts um, but here's the neat thing about the one ticket that's left not only is it the last ticket not only is it for this coming Thursday at six o'clock a great time of fellowship delicious food if you've never had a steak cooked by our own Dave Hall you don't know what you're missing and I mean it'll be a wonderful time am I building it up this ticket is free it's already been paid for somebody already bought it they're not coming so raise your hand Mr. Yarger whoever sees him first you know um We'd love to see you this coming Thursday night. Great time of fellowship, our stakeout, and looking forward to that, guys, this Thursday at 6 o'clock. Next Sunday, we are planning a, just a welcome for some of our newcomers. Everybody listen up. If, if you've only been a part of our church the last year, year and a half, and it's been a, an abbreviated schedule because of COVID and things like that, but you've begun to come and be a part of it, we want to welcome you to our church. And, and, and I mean that by saying we want to have just a little lunch for you immediately following the service we'll uh, we're going to pick up some pizza and have some salads and desserts and it's going to be an opportunity for you to interact with some of the the staff and the leadership the the people involved at church some ask some questions we're not going to drill you and and keep you for hours and hours we're just wanting you to know we welcome you and we want to answer questions and include you 
plan to join us. Um, if you're planning to, catch up with me or my wife after the service. You can email us. If you forget to do that, just stay next Sunday. There will be plenty of food. And as I told someone this morning, I, I won't eat any pizza. I don't need it. If there's not enough, there will be enough for you. And we'd love to have you stay. If you're a newcomer to our church, we, we want to welcome you. Um, in a couple of Saturdays, not this next Saturday, but the following on the 28th, there will be a memorial service uh, to celebrate the life of Shirley Smith. And, and that's Tammy Botter's mom who, who passed away over a year ago. And we'll be meeting here at the church. And, and we could also, um, if you could bring cookies to that, if you'd like to help them, it's going to be just some light snacks following the service, and we can be a blessing to the Botter family um, by bringing some cookies for that time. It'll be taking place um, not this coming Saturday, but the following Saturday. I think the service begins at 1 o'clock, and we invite you to be a part of that as well. And one last thing I'm going to mention. And this was not on my list until I went out to my um, truck to get my phone so I had a, an alarm to go off to tell me when it's time to quit. You guys know that doesn't work real well, but it'll be here. So we have it. As I was doing that, this big pickup truck backed in, and I thought I knew who it was. But lo and behold, there was one of our newest additions to our family was there, Liz and um, Eddie and a new addition, Daniel, is here with us today. Let's give him a hand. We welcome you. So good, and congratulations. Excited about what God's doing in your life, and so glad to have you here with us today. Let's continue to worship as we consider his word this morning. Please stand. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 6, this is what it reads. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked accordingly to the course of this world, accordingly to the prince of power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too are formerly lived in lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were, nature, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He has saved us. As we come to... Uh to him in worship. Um, he is our king. He is our savior. And, and I, like I said before, it, I know sometimes I, I don't bring what he deserves because he deserves everything. And this song, as we're going to sing, is, is all about bringing our hearts, just leaving everything else behind. It's, it's not about what we do for the church. It's not about those things are important but it's about bringing us, ourselves. That's what he wants. He wants our heart. He wants our soul. He wants us. Sing. When the music fades, all is stripped away. And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required you search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you All about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. 
nothing of endless worth No one could express How much do you deserve? Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it and it's all about you all about you Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it, and it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. He's our King. forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted You were condemned I'm alive and well Your spirit is within me Because you died and rose again Amazing love Amazing love How can it be you, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you. Amazing love. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, it's my joy to honor you in all I do, in honor you. Jesus, you are my King. Jesus, you are my King. Amazing love. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all I do, and I honor you in all I do. You may be 
seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it is just a blessing to gather together and worship you, to, to realize that bond of love that we have through the Lord Jesus that just unites us together in Christ. And, and as Liz read from Ephesians chapter 2, we're, we're so amazed, we marvel at your grace. Uh, that has forgiven us of sin, made us brand new in Christ, seated us in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, Father. You've lavished us with your love, your forgiveness, your grace, your mercy. You've changed us from the inside out, and we pray, Father, that our lives would bear witness of that, that people would see the difference and be drawn to a Savior, that you'd give us opportunities to, to let them know and to be bold in our, in our witness, not abrasive, just bold, to, to plant seeds of, of the gospel wherever you give us that opportunity. And, 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 and Father, we, we thank you for this week of Vacation Bible School and all the workers, the helpers, all the, the kids and families that were involved. We, we just pray that you would continue to be working in their lives and, and that the, the seeds of the, the gospel, the, the good news of, of forgiveness and, and new life in Jesus, that those seeds would bear fruit in your time. And, and we just thank you for the privilege of partnering with you to spread the good news. And Thank you for what you're doing in the, the Williams family. We continue to pray for Betty Lou's recovery. Thank you for the, the good surgery. And, um, and we just ask for your continued um, provision in their lives. And Father, to all the needs that are represented here, I know that they are many. And I also know that you know about each and every one of them. And so we take those needs, those cares, those concerns that we have and and we just cast them on you because you care for us. And we ask you to, to meet those needs as only you can, to lead this church for your glory, uh, for us all to realize that these things that we schedule are not just ritual or routine. They're not regulations. That This is because there's a relationship with you that comes through faith in Jesus and we pray that each of us would be challenged to walk closer and closer. Use your word in our lives now. May your Holy Spirit have free course. Thank you for the privilege of meeting together today. Draw us to Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. I'd invite you to open your Bibles, if you have one with you, to the book of Ruth. Um, it's a, a little book in the Old Testament. Um, only four chapters long. It's taken place during the period of the judges. Uh, the nation of Israel has, is in the land that God has promised, and, and there's a lot of ups and downs in their lives taking place. It covers about 350 years, not the book of Ruth, but that, that period does. In fact, God gives us a snapshot into something that was taking place that we might consider to be insignificant, too tiny to even mention. And yet, as you read through the, the 85 verses of the book of Ruth, you realize that nothing is too insignificant or little in God's hands. That he's causing it all to work together for good for, for those who love him, who he's called according to his purpose. And we get that snapshot here. And so I'm not going to cover a lot of, of review just to say that there's a family that leaves Judah because of a famine in the land. They leave the land of, of Israel. They, they journey over to Moab on the other side of the um, Jordan River, and they're there for about 10, 11 years. The, the husband passes away. The two sons die. They have married um, some wives from Moab there, and now Naomi decides it's time to head back to, to Bethlehem, to the land of Judah, and she basically tells her uh, her, her daughter-in-laws, um, who are widows as well, go back to your family, go back to your gods, go back to your culture here in Moab. I'm going back to the land of Judah, and, 
and, and God's blessing and peace be with you. Go back. And, and what we've learned in this study, these are just the first couple of chapters of the, of the book of Ruth, that what we, we, we come to find out is there, there is a, a study in comparison and contrast going on here. There are four different women that are mentioned in this book. And, and let me just say, just by passing, I'm not going to take a lot of time to say this, but you know, throughout the scriptures, God elevates the role of women. They are considered co-equals, co-inheritors in, in the grace of God. And, 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 and throughout the scriptures, they're considered two halves of one whole. And it's, it's like this. It's not like this. Do you understand what I'm saying? That, that it's a beautiful picture. And, and it's actually contrary to the culture most of the time where they were oppressed and put down. And, and the beautiful thing about this little book of Ruth, it's going to mention some very significant women and the roles that they play. And, and Ruth is going to be one of those women. Um, she's one of the, the daughter-in-laws to Naomi. The other one is Orpha. And, and, and then the other woman that we see is Naomi, the, their mother-in-law. And, and they're all widows. They're, they're all scheduled to go back. She tells them to, to go back to their, the land of their birth, their families, their culture, the influence to, to their gods. That's what she actually says. They've been with um, Elimelech's family for 10, 11 years now. And they've come to, to be exposed to the one true God, the worship of Jehovah in, this, in their homeland as these people have been displaced. And, and as she tells them to go back, we look at this contrast. One of the daughter-in-laws gives her a kiss on the cheek and heads back. And I'm not railing on her, but that's one of the contrasts that we see in the book. She was exposed, Orpha was exposed to the same things that Ruth was. Do you understand that? They, she, she saw the worship of God. She, she, she was exposed. She had the same opportunities, but given that opportunity and the chance to go back, she chooses to go back. We don't hear of her anymore in the scriptures. And, and maybe by God's grace, he drew her to a saving relationship with himself. We just don't know about that. But one thing that we do see is that's contrasted to the role that Ruth plays. Ruth is just the opposite. She clings to Naomi and she makes this statement that God has basically transformed my life. And so there's a comparison and a contrast, both exposed to, to God and his working in their life, but the responses are night and day different there. And I, I, we, we looked at Orpha a little bit last week, and, and we also looked at Naomi. Naomi is, I believe, a believer in the one true God. Um, but as she has experienced the difficult affliction and circumstances in life, those things that are designed by God to make us better, to grow us, to develop us, to mature us, instead of making her better, th- According to the text, and again, I'm not trying to be hard on her. This is just what we have in the scriptures. Those circumstances have kind of made her bitter. And, and she's vocal and she's expressing about that. And, and so we looked at that again. Naomi has the opportunity. She knows the one true God. She is a, she is a believer, I, I believe. But she's also complaining and critical and negative and not looking at those circumstances through the lens of of her relationship with God. And and folks, it's okay to be real. It's good for us to bear our hearts to God. All of us go through hardship, don't we? we? We go through affliction and adversity in life. And it's okay to, to question in the midst. It's okay to, to not like it and, and, and want it to be different. But ultimately, God wants us to surrender to, to his lordship in our lives and realize he's not wasting this. It's for our good and his glory. But that requires a response of faith on our part, a choice to see it differently. And, and throughout the book of Ruth, we don't really see that response in Naomi's life. So we looked at those two people. And, and now what we want to do is we, we want to look at 
the other two people. We want to spend a little bit of time looking at, at Ruth and her responses to, to what God's doing in her life. The same challenges. She's lost her husband. It's been difficult. It's been hard. But I want to see her response and compare and contrast it to, to Orpha who went back. And then there's another group of women included in this book. And they're just called Other Women. And I think that there's a comparison to them and Naomi. They're believers in the one true God. And I think they're seeing things a little differently. Now you might say, okay, but they're not experiencing what Naomi did. And you're right. They're not described as losing their husband, going to a strange land, experiencing the affliction and the difficulty. But would you not agree they probably experienced some difficulty in their life? What was the setting for this whole thing? Famine. Life's hard in, in Judah and the nation of Israel. But what seems to come across, there's not a lot of details, but the way that they respond and the declarations they make would, would challenge us to see that they're looking at life differently. They're trusting in God and it's making a difference in their perspective. Do you believe that that's still true today? The way that we look at life and our circumstances, both the, the high times and the low times, the big times and the tiny things, the way that we look at them in view of our relationship with God, our active trust in him, depending on him moment by moment, makes a difference in the way that we see life. Would you not agree that's still true? Folks, people are watching us. We, we claim to be changed from the inside out, that Jesus Christ has, has made that difference, and sometimes they don't see the difference. We, we fall into their influence, and we look and act and believe just like they do. And there's a, a challenge for us as believers to examine and evaluate our own lives. You know, yesterday was an interesting afternoon for, for me and for a number of folks, um, we had a, a wonderful celebration of life, um, celebrating at a memorial service for Ty Woodard yesterday. And um, a number of you are able to be a part of that and to, to hear the singing and, and God's word and the sharing and uh, to, to hear the testimonies of how God had, had worked in Ty's life and through Ty's life. You know, that, that's what it was. It, we don't really call them funerals when we're talking about a believer because we know where he is. He, he's in heaven rejoicing with his Savior right now, and we miss him tremendously. Um, but we know where he is. And so it was a time of, uh, of gathering together and, and celebrating. And I got to be honest, I, I shed a few tears um, before the service, um, during the service, um, as I heard and as I listened and songs that were sung and things that were shared, it brought back a lot of wonderful memories that I will treasure for the rest of my life. And, and there were some tears, sometimes where it was hard to, to talk, you know, um, but it was also a wonderful testimony to God's grace in the lives of his people. And that came forth pretty much bold and clear. And I was so grateful to be a part. And, and Patty, we continue to pray for you. And we're so grateful for being a part of that. And just looking forward to what God's going to continue to do in your life. Because he's obviously not finished yet. You're still here with us. And... That was one of the things that I was able to experience yesterday afternoon. But as soon as that was over, the reason I didn't talk to most of you, I took off, Patty and I took off for a wedding. That's what I'm trying to say. This is a different type of day for us. But I'll talk about that at the end of the service, okay? Um, another experience through which God took us that brought some tears as well and some reminders of how he's constantly working in our lives and wastes nothing. And the seemingly little, insignificant, tiny things that we don't even consider after they're gone are still used by God. We don't know how seeds that are planted can bear fruit in God's time and in his way. VBS is a, is a testimony of that. And 
children's ministries. The fact that you're here, this is not coincidence. It's not happenstance. God has you here for a purpose, to hear his word. And that's not the only thing. Every choice, decision, the things we experience are under his care, and he uses them. He doesn't waste them. And that's true in the book of Ruth. If you have your Bibles open, I want to start looking at that next um, woman that's being compared. In chapter 1, verse 15, we, we see a little bit about Ruth's character. Chapter 1, look with me at verse 15. Then she said, Behold your sister-in-law, this is Naomi speaking, Behold your sister-in-law, Orpha, um, has gone back to her people, and, and the text tells us, and her gods, her worship, her, her influence, her lifestyle. She's returned. What we don't see in Orpha's life is any evidence of true conversion to the worship of the one true God. We don't see that, at least in the text. You see the contrast that's being established? Naomi says, your, your, your fellow sister-in-law has gone back. What does she say? You return after your sister-in-law. You too, Ruth. I know you're holding on to me. You're clinging to me. Go back to, to your family, your people, your culture, your gods, your worship, your lifestyle. And I want us to see Ruth's declaration. And this declaration shows us that there's a conversion that has taken place in Ruth's life. I'm not saying it takes place right now. We don't know that. But this testimony about it does. It takes place and it's as objective and clear as it can be. Look at what Ruth says in response to Naomi in verse 16 of chapter 1. Do not urge me to leave you or turn back. I love the way it's said there. Turn back, to go back. It has nothing to offer me is what she's implying in that saying. Do not urge me to turn back from following you. Now look at this statement of faith. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And don't you just love this next statement? Your God, my God. Something's changed her life. She's come to faith in the one true God, exposed just like Orpha, but the response to God's grace is different. And it's a clear testimony of this conversion, and the conversion that's taken place in her life leads to this conviction of commitment that involves change continually because she knows God is her God, the one true God, and it makes all the difference in this life and the next. Look at how she goes on in verse 17. Where you die, I'll die. There I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. When Naomi, when she saw that she was determined, I've got that underlined, uh, the conviction in her voice, the commitment, God has changed her from the inside out and she'll never be the same. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Let me ask you, does that describe our conversion experience, friends? Those of us that have experienced God's amazing grace that, that we read about in, in Ephesians chapter 2, we turned from darkness into his light. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. And he's made us alive by grace we've been saved. And, and the verses that go on say, um, you know, that it's by grace that we've been saved through faith, not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works so that we won't boast. Because we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared in advance that we walk in them. That's the message of conversion. It's not a flash in the pan, a one night type of thing where I raise my hand and I, I try to get some fire insurance. You'll get that if you understand what, what eternal separation involves in a, in a place called hell, a lake of fire. It's not this one little thing, okay, I made a deal with God, okay, God, get off my back. I, 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 I made this profession of faith and but now leave me alone. I'm going to live life on my terms. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to enjoy it all. And, and it doesn't matter. what. That's not true conversion, friends. Do you understand? 
Conversion is a surrender to him to say, you're my God. I need you. I want forgiveness. The only way to be right with you is through faith in your son who died and rose again for me. Now, I can't tell you Ruth understood that. That was still future for her. But by God's providential plan, she's going to be in the lineage that brings about the Messiah. This little insignificant story shows us that, that nothing's insignificant from, in God's mind and in his hands. And I can't help but, but even ask myself and, and challenge all of us to do the same as we evaluate and examine. Listen, we evaluate and examine our own lives. I'm not asking you to look around. I'm saying look in here. Is it clear that Jesus is my Savior and Lord? Is it evident that there's been change? Is there a conviction and a commitment that's continuing? That, that what God has begun in you, he will bring to perfection, to maturity, according to Philippians chapter 1? Is that evident for people to see? It should be. I'm not saying there aren't times where, where we're not walking as close. I'm not saying there aren't times where we still fall and, and fail, we sin. What I'm saying is when that happens, how quick do we confess it and come back in repentance to our God? How, how clear is it, is it evidenced in people's lives around us that something's different in his life and her life? There's a commitment, a conviction that, that doesn't just take place on Sunday mornings. I'm glad you're here. Please come back next Sunday. But the conversion, this relationship with God is not about religion or ritual that you have to be here on Sunday or you don't get your gold star. This is talking about a relationship with the one true God and the only way to be right with him is to admit I need to be rescued. I've sinned. I've turned my back on you. And I believe the only way to be forgiven and to be made right with you is to trust Jesus as Savior and Lord, to believe he died and rose again for me. Call out to him right where you sit. Rescue me. Be my Lord, my master. I'm yours. That's what we see in, in Ruth's life. And yes, it's Old Testament times, and, and she's going to be looking forward, taking God at his word, and ultimately learning that a Messiah is going to come. And, and, and as it just happened, as luck would have it, it'd be through her lineage. No, it's not luck. It's not chance. It's recorded for us to see the conversion that brought conviction, that, that led to commitment, that led to change. A lot of C words, right? Continually, constantly. Acknowledging them moment by moment in our lives. I need you. I want to read on and describe Ruth just a little bit more. Um, look at chapter 2, verse 1. We're introduced to the, the hero in the story that's going to be a picture of uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to redeem Ruth, and, and we'll talk about that in the weeks to come. His name is Boaz, and, and he's a close relative of, of Naomi, Elimelech's either, maybe his brother, maybe his cousin, and, and, and there's a, a role for him to play to take care of Naomi and Ruth, and, and that's all I'm going to say now. You can read for yourself more about that, but we'll discuss him. He's introduced in chapter 2, verse 1, and look at verse 2. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, please, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I might find favor. And Naomi said to her, go, my daughter. And what are we starting to see here in Ruth's life? You know, this, this commitment to God has changed her life from the inside out. And it's evident in some exciting ways. She's determined. It's not a short-term thing. It's forever. Not only when she's buried, but for all eternity. She's surrendered. She's all in in this worship of God. But now in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we, we see something else. We see that she's willing we see that she's humble. She, we see that she's sacrificial. We see that she's giving. 
we, we she, see that she's active. See, they're back in the land there, and she understands we don't have the means to take care of us. And so she says, let me go. I'll provide for our house. Elimelech's gone. The, the two sons are gone. I'll go. And, and in essence, she's really saying, I'll humble myself because she's going to go after the, the people that harvest the grain, and she's going to pick up the leftovers to meet their needs. That's what gleaning is, to, to pick up the leftover stuff. And, and God provided for that to take care of the, the poor people in his, in, his, in his people. And so she willingly says, let me go do the work. Let, I love that about her. We see change and, and, and sacrifice. We, we see her humility to be willing to do that. Something else happens. Read on in verse 3. So she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. Now we mentioned this a few weeks ago because then the verse says this, and she just happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. She just happened, as luck would have it, coincidentally, chance, haphazardly, she just ends up there. That's not even what the scriptures are saying there, but I love the way it's recorded. It just happened. God is weaving this beautiful tapestry of, of order and praise and redemption through this story. And, and from her perspective, she just happens to end up in Boaz's field. Here's an important thing that we see from her life. Her conversion and, and that commitment, her faith in God that leads to this determined, um, committed lifestyle that involves humility and sacrifice and willingness to help others. That faith is active. She's not sitting back saying, okay, God, you do it. I don't know what it is. We don't have anything to eat. I don't know what to, she's not just sitting back waiting for it to be in the sky. Tell me to do this or provide this just to do. She's willing. This is so beautiful. Her faith leads to obedience. It leads to activity. It leads to involvement. Do you know that's still true for us today? Do you understand, any of you remember learning to drive a car when it didn't have power steering? Well, show me your age, right? I remember learning to drive that. And the one thing that was hard for me to understand at first, my dad kept saying, it's a lot easier to turn if you do what? Get it moving. Get it rolling. Some of you guys that have grown up with power steering, you don't understand what I'm talking about. When you don't have the ability mechanically to help you turn that, it's a whole lot easier to steer, to, to turn, to be directed. If that vehicle's moving, you can turn that wheel easy. Just standing still, you're grabbing to turn that. And there's a picture of, of the conversion in Christianity and our active faith in God as I'm trusting him and obeying and actively going forward that there's a demonstration of change in my life and as I'm growing more and more and more guess what God directs he steers he, he, in fact as you're growing closer and closer to God you will see divine appointments everywhere and those are called kairos moments in the New Testament. The Greek word for time that we're most familiar with is chronos, chronological time. The one that concerns you most and you're hoping this alarm works, right? It's the clicking of the clock, right? The chronological. But the beautiful thing about the scriptures in the Greek language, there's another Greek word that's sometimes translated time. In the book of Ephesians where we read before, in chapter 5, it says redeeming the time because the days are evil. That's not chronos. It's kairos. And that means divine appointments. And folks, as we're actively trusting God and moving forward and we're growing in this conversion experience, God directs us. And that means his direction sometimes takes us to the mountaintop where the view is glorious. Sometimes it's down in the valleys of affliction and hardship and confusion. And for the believer, that view should be just as glorious. I'm not talking about being unreal and a big paste of smile on your face. I love this, Jesus. 
No, you can be real, but you also know he's in control of that and he's not wasting it. As you're actively trusting, you're getting to know him better and you want to want what he wants and he directs our lives. Providence, what a blessing to be a part of the people of God. And we see that happening. She gets busy. She gets active. She sacrifices. She's going forward. And God just happens to direct her to Boaz's field. You see the picture that we're talking about? It's a glorious one. But we got to move on quickly here. Let me just go on to some of the other things that we see in Ruth's life. The wind blew my pages all around, so um, let me get back on track. God directs as we're trusting him. It's faith in action. Verse 7, look at this in chapter 2 of verse 7. Boaz sees Ruth. He comes to the field to inspect and asks one of his servants, well, who's that? girl I, I don't know that lady that woman right that's what happens in the verses that follow you get to verse 6 and one of his servants that's in charge of the reapers replied she's a young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab and she said please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves thus she came now look at this, and has remained from morning until now. She's been sitting in the house for just a little while. Now, the house was probably a temporary sh shelter just constructed to give them some shade in the, the heat of the, the, of the sun. Do you get what I mean? Kind of like what we would enjoy. And, and what the servant is basically saying, yeah, you're noticing her because she's not out in the field, but please understand, Boaz, she's not lazy. She's been working from morning to now. She's getting a little break. And, and it's, it's wonderful to see how God is working. She's been working hard all morning long. And the servant makes it clear to say, yeah, she's just in here for a little while. You ever think about that kind of testimony when you're at work or when you're at school? Do you realize people are watching us? If your break that's supposed to be 15 minutes always turns into 30 or 45 minutes, people see that. If you think it's okay to cheat a little bit on a test and nobody will know, God knows and the reality is probably people do. Do you, do you understand that there are things that people are looking to see in our lives and when our lives don't back up the conversion, the, 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 the change that God has wrought, it speaks volumes too. And it challenges each of us to be growing moment by moment. We think, okay, this is the spiritual stuff I do for the week I come to church. The rest, eh, that's just my own, and I do whatever, and God doesn't... That, nothing could be further from the truth. What we are exposed to and learn here should equip us and edify us and build us up and prepare us to go out into the world and show that Jesus has changed our life. We should have lives of integrity. We should be responsible. We should be loving. We should be caring. We should be forgiving and gracious and merciful. We should be responsible. She was. Again, don't look around. Myself included, look in here. Does that describe us? People are watching, friends. She was a hard worker. Look at verse 10 of the same chapter. Not only that, but the humility. Boaz tells Ruth in verse 8, keeps working in this field. My servants will take care of you. Um, there's something that he notices there. Do you understand? And so he gives the instruction to her to stay, keep working. And I want you to see Ruth's response when Boaz speaks to her. Verse 10 says, Then she, this is talking about Ruth, fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight? That I, that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner. I'm not even of the people of God. I'm from Moab. And you're taking notice of me. But do you understand what she did first? She fell on her face in humility. She didn't care what people thought. She was so excited that Boaz had noticed that she had this opportunity that it stirred up in her in this question, why me? You know, that's the response of someone who's been redeemed by God's grace. Why me? I don't deserve this. 
Do you understand that pride and independence and self-sufficiency and selfishness should not characterize our lives as children of the King of Kings, Lord of Lords that have experienced his grace? Humility should. Wonder, awe his amazing grace. Moment by moment, God's working in my life. You know, as I look out here, I, I see probably close to 100 people of us gathered together. We're being challenged from God's word and, and comforted and consoled and taught. But it's not just 100 of us here. You know, if each of you, if each of us rubs shoulders, bumps into, works, goes to school or out on the, the soccer field, let's just say this week, you, you meet, come in contact with 10 people, just 10. Most of us will meet more people than that this week. We'll, we'll be around them at work or in our neighborhood, in our families. We will, but let's just say it's just 10. Do you realize that's a thousand spheres of influence represented just here? You know, many people aren't maybe going to come and hear it directly at least not at first. They're going to learn about Jesus through what they see in us. Be, make no mistake, they're watching. Tremendous opportunity for us. But if I'm not growing closer and, and believing in his grace and moment by moment needing and, and, and trusting him and, and obeying him, you know where my focus becomes? Right here, right now, and what's in it for me. And if that's my focus, a lot of times I'm not going to like it. You understand what I'm saying? If my focus is him and it's growing and his grace is so amazing and, it's, and, and I'm seeing it over and over in his life, it'll still be hard, it'll still be difficult, but I'll know he's not wasting it and that difference will open my eyes to see the kairos divine appointments, the opportunities that God is placing in all of our lives every moment of every day. I better check to see if this is working. Some of you... It isn't. The alarm didn't go off. Or so. Did anybody hear the alarm? You're kind of glad I looked at the chronos instead of just kairos. 1033. Well, we're not going to get to the other women today. But as we finish with Ruth, I, I just want to bear testimony again. Life was changed. The story goes on to say how, how God used her. She eventually gets the privilege of of bearing a son, and that son's name is Obed, and eventually Obed will have a son named Jesse, and Jesse will have a son named David, King David, through whom the, the line of the Christ will come to redeem us all. I said earlier, yesterday was an interesting experience to leave a, a memorial service where I had tears and to go to a wedding. And... and the wedding was great. We got there a little late, didn't really get it. It was outdoors, and we were able to see that a little bit. But I, I guess I want to talk more about the reception. Because when we got to the reception, um, you know, it's a, time, it's, a, it's a reception, celebration, right? And I'm excited for the couple and neat things going on. Um, but I'm also seeing people that I haven't seen for a while because our kids have grown up. You know what I mean? They're not in school and all the activities like they always are, you know, like that connects us in the community a lot more than it does now at this stage in our life. And as luck would have it, coincidentally, it just happened that we were seated at table 13 uh, with David and Sarah. They were there and we sat next to them and we're grateful that we were able to sit with them. But the other four people sitting at our table Three out of the four graduated from Naples High School with our twins, Luke and Ben. Hadn't seen any of them for years. Do you understand? Um, not really involved in their lives hardly anymore, but there was the three out of the four. And one of them had married in and um, uh, she was actually from the Clark Summit area where our daughter Megan is. So there's some neat connection there. But um, when I saw the one that I happened to sit next to, um, 
I made a statement to her because, you know, after church last Sunday, I got a call from our oldest son, Jake. Um, he, he had run sound down at Grace Road Church in downtown uh, Rochester. He and Luke were involved there and, and worship there. And, um, and he said, you know what? There, we had a baptism at church today. And he said, you know who was baptized? And he mentioned the name of the girl sitting right next to me. So I mentioned that to her. I said, you know, Jake called me and said something happened last Sunday and her eyes got big and I got tears there like I'm getting them now. Um, she got baptized and um, she was never a real regular part of our church, but she came through VBS in a, a hop. Uh, knew her all through her lives and through her life and um, she got excited and I didn't know if I should go into it more because you don't always know um, what it means for people. So that's all that happened at first. A little bit later, we had time to talk more and for the next 30 minutes, she shared with me her journey of faith and talked about the hard times and the difficult times, the times that didn't make sense and how God was bringing her to a place of surrender and she had to loosen her grip on control. Sound familiar to any of I mean, and I couldn't help but think of Ruth and, and what had changed her life. And, and as she's talking with me more and more, she just happened to be down in Florida a few weeks ago and, and, and saw somebody just happened to get baptized in the ocean. And she ran up and got excited and talked and hugged the person. And, and, and her mom didn't understand. I, I want you to understand that... She's probably the only one that knows Jesus personally in this family right now. But they weren't supposed to have a baptismal service last week. It was supposed to be scheduled in October. And when she got back, she said to her, the leaders or pastor church, I got to be baptized now. And Jake had told me people that he saw there, but I couldn't figure out. who. So I asked her and she started telling me one of them, two or three of them were co-workers with me. Uh, two or three of them, was one was an aunt. One was a, a financial services lady in her 80s that wanted to say, and I'm just starting. And she talked about God and then she says to me on on November 19th 2019 I got saved and and she said in the process thanks for a hopwa she said I don't remember a bunch of the stuff you taught I'm, I'm sorry I it didn't break my heart she just said I had fun and you showed me God was real and Folks, we don't know who's watching. We don't know the seeds that will bear fruit in God's time and in his way. And so the tears I had earlier at the memorial service came out in another way. And, and it was just such a challenge to me, folks. Ruth is a picture of conversion, conviction, commitment, constant change, growth, believing that God's in control. He doesn't waste anything. And he's drawing us closer and closer to him. If you've not trusted him as Savior and Lord, folks, I challenge you again. Place your faith in Jesus. Sin's forgiven. Heaven's your home. And an adventure of faith is the rest of life. There will be ups. There will be downs. You can't have adventure without adversity. They come from the same word. But it's only adventure when we know our God's in control, wasting nothing. Would you go to prayer with him, with me, as we talk to him, as we close? God, we just praise you. We sing of your glory, of your greatness. You are awesome. And your Lord, your master, we admit that humbly as we bow before you. And we thank you that you've begun a good work in us. We thank you, Father, that Jesus has made a difference in our lives. And, and it's not just a one-time thing. It's forever till we're home with you. We pray that each of us would evaluate and examine and look at our lives. Does, does that conversion, that relationship with you, does it show to my friends at school, out on the soccer field, when I'm in class with them in the, the weeks ahead, does it show at work? Does it show with my family? Does it show with my friends and my neighbors? 
Father, if, if our perspectives have become critical and negative and change them, help us to see that you deserve all glory and praise and may we grow closer and closer to Jesus. May your spirit control us and use this mighty influence represented here to mo go make a difference wherever you take us and plant seeds of the gospel that can bear fruit in your time for your glory because you are worthy. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.